You ever read the, what was it, um, was it Grover? I think it was Grover, the Sesame Street book, the monster at the end of the book. <clears throat> you know, he reads through the book and he keeps looking for this monster. And if I remember it correctly, it's been a few years since I read it to writer 4,000 times, but he gets to the end of the book and the monster is him. We're the monsters. Um, <laughs> this situation has really went kind of berserk with the whole uh, coronavirus. Um, I did a an episode about the coronavirus, kind of about how I felt about the coronavirus and, and talking about it. I did one with tons of research that I deleted, and if I had to do over again, I wouldn't have deleted it. I would have just done it. I still have the research. Um I think I'm going to do it again. I, I enjoy, I don't know, kind of looking into it. It gives you a good look into the psyche of people. But um, the the thing about any situation, be it good or bad, that's important is, is learning from it. It's important to to try to get whatever knowledge and experience and, and learn from something any way you can and there is a lot of opportunity here to learn from this. Um, there's a lot of disappointment for me in the way that people reacted, but there's room to definitely room to learn and and to grow. Um, I'm not going to get into information and statistics on the disease on the virus. It, the, I'll, if I decide to do the other one, I'll, I'll do the other one. But a couple of things become very clear and very apparent. Um, first off is we should have, as a people, even though I don't believe we did, realize three very important things. One, we should never trust the media. They, they've lost that. Um, they're fear mongers and... and even if a situation is dire, it is still important that you receive factual information. And and we did not receive that. We should have learned that it's important for a president to be uh, reassuring and for a government to be honest. And we didn't get that. To be nonchalant about something, even if it's not dangerous, despite the fact that it is dangerous, is a ridiculous stance to make. But not being completely forthcoming, and I don't know. I, I we, we should we should learn from that, if nothing else. Our, our main leadership failed us. Our media, like it always does, failed us. One thing I have noticed, though, state government, and this is why I'm so big on states having the right to make choices, state governments have done extremely well once the ball was put into their court. I live in Kentucky, and I feel that Kentucky's government has, governor and, and, and government in, collectively have done a, a really good job, um, and they're trying to stay in front of this. Another thing we should have learned from from this is there is a difference in the United States and everybody else. Um, our, our media is atrocious. Um, we're so huge and so large and so spread out that it's like having 50 different countries living under one flag. And so it's hard to address everyone at one time. But we also seem to be ahead of the curve. I don't know how long that will last, but I feel like we, despite being a slow start, despite not doing what we should have done to begin with, still have a, a really good grasp on the situation and are making really good progress. Um, I don't understand, I do understand the panic buying. <laughs> And to me, that's that's the real issue here. That's the thing that really worries me is people 
with the means to panic buy right now. People doing so based on poor information and and fear-mongering. No one's saying this isn't serious. But something I've learned over many years, honestly, it's it's been very apparent over very many years, but, but one thing I've learned specifically but that's been reinforced in these last couple of weeks is pay attention who you're listening to the media is not somebody you should be listening to um this is an infectious disease um it it or you know a virus it's to me i would have to assume that we need to listen to um scientists and and specialists people from the CDC, people from the Center for uh, Infectious Disease, um, people of of that ilk, um, worldwide leaders in research and and vaccines. And and if it it comes to to medicines and and things of that nature, those research scientists and those uh, pharmacists who, who, when it comes to medications, are uh, unbelievably well-educated, you know, there's a lot of people we can listen to but one thing that's come apparent to me over the years is the last person you really want to listen to in a situation like this, it seems idiotic, but it seems to be true, is a doctor. Um, doctors are a lot like a human mechanic. They don't specialize in much of anything unless they're a specialist. And in that case, that's a different thing. But just your, your average, every, I, I, I can name four doctors that have said this is absolutely of no concern to anyone. Just you know, there's doctors telling a family member of mine that it's no big deal, it's nothing to worry about. That's, I don't know if it's an arrogance because of the the prestige that comes with their title, but that means nothing to me. Again, in a situation like this, I, I like to revert to, to the people who, who've spent a lifetime specializing in such things. And it's important, it's important who we listen to. But these panic buys and, and things of that nature is scary because I wonder about people on a fixed income. They only get a certain amount of money each month. They only have a certain amount of money to do them all month. They can't go out and panic buy. Now, I also worry about older people, people who aren't able to get out or, or you know, to, to panic buy or, or do or get things. And then, you know, we have a, a, an issue because my son is autistic. He has uh, a sensory process. My son eats IGA brand butter popcorn, no other brand. He can smell it and tell you that it's not his brand. He eats Dairy Queen French fries, getting to the point that it's almost exclusively exclusively from the Hyman Dairy Queen. And he eats puff corn, you know, only the Cheetos butter puff corn, that's it. And he eats yogurt occasionally. And he drinks one type of small Nestle bottled water. That's it. His resolve and his issue is severe enough that if I do not have those things to feed him, he will quit eating. He's done it before. He's been hospitalized. He's been in the hospital for over a week without eating. If he gets sick and throws up and vomits, he may quit eating. He may decide in a moment's notice that those are not the foods that he wants any longer. I'm a warrior, so, you know, we probably have 10, 15 boxes of popcorn put up, but we stay ahead on popcorn. I, years ago, was what you'd call a prepper, and I did so pretty aggressively. Um, not severely, but fairly aggressively. Um I kept food, medical supplies, ammunition, things of that nature. And I quit watching the news. This has been years back. And actually, we switched to basically online TV. We switched to Netflix, Amazon Prime. We dropped satellite. Uh, We didn't have cable. And I started reading my news, reading it from certain sources, um, not reading editorials, op-eds, not really anything that is an opinion piece. I started 
looking at information, if information was given to me in an article, if information was given to me in a piece of news, to actually take that information and fact check it. And what I would often find is, not that the numbers or the information was wrong, it's just it was presented in a way that represented it to be something it was not. I knew the media was untrustworthy years before Donald Trump made it in vogue to say so. And I think, of if you find no other positive out of his presidency, at least that woke up a couple more people when he presented that. And it was obvious. He made it obvious. It's obvious now. H1N1 was a killer. By the time of its completion, it could have been devastating. But it was presented in a different way. Now, we're far from this being over. and These numbers could climb to surpass that. There's no doubt in that. But that disease warranted just as much of a reaction as this disease, of this virus, if we're going to react that way, which I don't recommend. <clears throat> the way that, um, I can't remember if it was the bird flu or the swine flu that was, I mean, it was a killer. It was probably the most dangerous we've ever had, far more dangerous than this. And China acted so swiftly because they knew that was a population killer. We've had some bad things hit in the past. We are surely going to have some bad things hit going forward. A lot of scientists believe that with the melting of the permafrost, we are going to have some uh, the possibility of, of some very old bacterium and, and various viruses be reintroduced that we have no immunities built up for. So... It, it is important to be prepared. It is important to be informed. It is important to be cautious and concerned. But panic. See, you can take a mild situation or even a situation that's concerning like the one we have now. It's not showing in any way, shape, or form to be deserving of the panic it's receiving, but it is definitely serious but you could hide it, heighten that and make it the situation much worse with the panic what if a month from now there's no food we don't realize how weak our infrastructure is we don't have gardens we don't grow our own food you know many americans do but not the majority not not even close to the majority so we have become very reliant on a system that is somewhat fragile. If we crippled that system, then, then we have an issue. And, and, and it becomes amplified when the illness is added. That's like I've seen some people kind of freaking out over the the lockdowns and and the, the closing the businesses and and all these restrictions on travel and these things. You understand that we are far better off with our form of medicine, and this is not to be political because I, I want everyone to get health care. I really do, but I don't want to go in over our heads and. I will probably, in defense of this, do a whole episode to break this down, but Italy is a, a very good example of how unplanned socialized medicine can break down. They're letting people die. Now, they're at a huge disadvantage. Their population is mostly over 50. They have the oldest, pop, I think one of the oldest population by percentage in the world. But America has the ability to handle the tide of medical emergency that's coming. Now, I've heard talks about cost of vaccines. 
there's a lot of varying opinions there on, on even when the vaccine is going to be ready. I know there's some being tested now, but the logical thing is it's going to take a year or two to, to get a definite match. Either way, um, someone said it's going to be a lot like the flu vaccine. People aren't going to be able to afford it. Um, you need to look into your local resources. Those flu vaccines are often free um, most of the time. I've heard people say that they're worried about being treated and being cared for in this in, in a time like this and because they don't have medical insurance hospitals won't turn you away any other time uh it's illegal for them to um and, and in a situation like this they're definitely going to treat you and, and quarantine you um a lot of people may end up being quarantined and treated in their home that would be the best possible scenario in most cases because it would reduce that spread but to get mad because they're closing these things down and doing these things because you think they're overreacting they're not overreacting because older people and people with medical issues they they stand to suffer the most but with isolation everyone's going to get it for the most part i mean um they've kind of said that from the beginning and it's not really that big a deal people try to compare it to the flu well, without a vaccine, the flu would probably be a much higher killer. The flu is almost comparable to this point with a vaccine. So, no, it, it's not like the flu. It's not the same exact thing. It's actually, if I'm not mistaken, a cold virus. And a lot of people have symptoms more uh, resembling a cold other than th this is generally deteriorating into a, uh, I guess, untreated in, into a, a, a pneumonia type illness but children uh, are not seeming to have as much of an issue they're seeming to be more carriers it's not so that children can't get sick the elderly are the ones taking the blunt of the the death toll that however is true with almost anything including the flu the issue with this disease with this virus I don't, I don't know exactly i've heard it referred to a hundred different ways and a few of those ways i know is not accurate but i'm, I'm trying to be as uh, i don't like being inaccurate when, when i talk about something like that um two of the main issues is that the symptoms you can be contagious before you show symptoms that makes it hard um makes it real hard um to, to catch it, you know, and not spread it. And the other is, we don't have any immunity and antibodies built up in our systems for it, and we don't have any um, vaccine or anything to fight it with. Um, so again, it's a lot, a lot like the flu, if the flu was unchecked. Um, probably won't be a killer on the level that the Spanish flu is a killer. Um, probably won't be a killer on the level that polio, you know, even was a killer. Um, but it has the ability to be devastating. The issue really is we determine to what level this thing gets. Um, we decide how bad the issue really becomes by the way we react, by the way we treat each other. Um, so if, if you look at every circumstance that we find ourselves in as humans, no matter how dire the situation, no matter how dangerous the obstacle, in almost every situation, I would say, in all fairness, 99% of the time, people become the most dangerous variable in the situation. We're smarter and stronger than we give ourselves credit for. We have to be somewhat self-reliant. And, and I've, I've learned that again. It was something that I thought I was being paranoid about and overreacting over, but, but it, it, it is something I'm going to go back to looking at. We have to be informed we can't give in to fear and fear-mongering. We can't be a part of the problem. Nobody's excited about this. Nobody's pumped for this. I'm scared for this. 
my daughter isn't home right now. You know, she's gone. I can't control what she does, but she's not home right now. And she's going to have to hang out somewhere before she can come home because I've got a son that can't be gotten sick. And I I have family around me. I worry about my mother. My, my mother's sick. I worry about my mother-in-law. I worry about my wife's granny and grandpa. I really worry about my mama and Minnie. I I worry about these people who struggle, you know, already with health issues. Um, my mother has pneumonia right now, not related to this. So I worry about her a, a lot. But more than anything, I worry about people becoming so panic-stricken that they cause a much greater issue than we already have. And that's that's what we're on the road to do, you know. I expect that from other places, but I don't expect that from us. We didn't get to where we are at the position we are in the world by reacting that way. Now, I've seen a ton of things, all these people offering free food to 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 school kids and to elderly people offering to bring people groceries and that's the people that we need in a situation like this. And I believe that's the majority of us. When I go to Walmart, like I had to go today, um, to be honest with you, I, I don't know, you know, if they're going to close these completely down or what. We keep food put back. We have enough food to make it a while. Um, I believe a month comfortably. A little over a month eating things we don't want to eat, which is, you know, what you got to do sometimes. I keep, my son cannot take oral medications of any kind. So if he starts to run a fever, um, suppositories are the only option we have without taking him to the doctor. So we keep those and, and keep them in stock. They're hard to find, but we, we, we keep, a, you know, some of those. But it's not because we were somewhat prepared that I'm not concerned. I am concerned. But I've not deviated from my thoughts process from the time this started. I was somewhat misinformed when it started early. I thought it was milder than the flu. And I should have known due to the fact that we do not have any type of vaccine or anything of that nature. It's not going to be milder than the flu. But I was... It was very clearly stated very early on that in order for this to really run its course and get out, the majority of us are going to have to get it. And that the majority of us are going to be okay. There's some underlying health issues and things of that nature. When when we look at South Korea, man, they're either handling this much better than, than the rest of the world or... That's going to be par for the course. We can't look at the numbers coming from China because you can't believe anything coming from China. Um, we can't really look at the numbers coming from Italy because our... There's two issues here. Our demographic, our age range. Italy's just on a weird end of that spectrum. You know, I, I would have to do the research, but somewhere out there, there's the country on the opposite end of that spectrum. Now, there's some numbers coming out of France that are a little weird, a little iffy with some, some younger people, uh, 50 and under. But, you know, that could be related to a lot of things. More than anything, it could be related to some genetic issues. Because I know they they thought that early on here, especially out of Washington, there was a guy out of college in Washington, thought he was going to be able to track and, and, and estimate cases based on a genetic marker. That still may be possible, but somewhere in the world, there's, you know, there's going to be a much younger society who, who's probably not going to have an issue with this. Um, but we we know what we know about it, and there's some some solid facts about it. It's not the killer that it's made out to be. It is very dangerous for older individuals. I would assume. Uh, based on some of the other statistics I've seen, that it's going to hold steady, that it can be fairly dangerous for very, very young infants. Um, 
but I haven't seen a lot of numbers on that yet. So that's that's not a statement of fact. That's that's a hypothesis based on what what some other stuff has, has looked like. Uh, there's some people, some underlying um, medical conditions. M- my wife has high blood pressure. That that's one of those. Um, but fear and panic are the two big things that that kind of concern me and and that really leads me to to look at two things that I find very important that one of which I've always believed uh, was an issue um, and the other which it, I, I've realized I, I need to reevaluate the the first one being our manufacturing and our distribution of a lot of things, you know, I could do whole um, podcasts on NAFTA and, and free trade and and um, Clinton executing the unions in in the United States. I, I could I could literally go on for days. Uh, one of my most one of the most despised humans I've I've ever known, and, and and it was the catalyst for where we are now. Worrying about the production of masks, the production of medicines, the production of vaccines, um, things of that nature. Big pharma has raped and controlled our society uh, for a very long time. Come to Eastern Kentucky. Come to West Virginia. Uh, come to to Florida, to Louisiana. Come, you know, come to the Oxycontin Highway. Let us show you the repercussions of an unchecked big pharmaceutical drug dealers. So they've made their money. They they've done so very well. Um, we should have production of the vital medications that we need here in the United States. And to what level they're produced here, I don't know. I do know, however, that. Many people in the government and, and many officials and many scientists have expressed a concern for our ability to get a lot of those ingredients and a lot of those things because they come out of China. There's absolutely no excuse for that. We as Americans may have to start paying more for items, but that in turn is going to have to be offset by a better financial situation. And that's a completely, totally different uh, topic of conversation for a different podcast altogether, but our lack of manufacture for the things that we need in this country, including some food, is is very, very evident in times like this. We, we owe it to ourselves to have the ability, the knowledge base, and the the foundation to produce those things here. One hundred percent. It if this shows us nothing else, it should show us that. And the only way to get those things back are to get the politicians out of office that we have in office now. Politicians who are getting paid by the companies that are doing this work overseas for nothing, and that's both parties. If if nothing else, both parties should show you right now that they don't care about you. At a presidential level, they don't care about you. The president is saying some of the most idiotic things, or has said some of the most idiotic things, and most careless and nonchalant things I've ever heard a president say in the last couple weeks. And the Democrats have used this as a political tool for the last couple weeks. Neither party cares about you. You have no value to them outside of a vote. It's not real. Bernie Sanders is not communist. He's just as big a crook as as Trump, and he's just as fixated on the money and the power. Get your heads out of your butts and and start thinking with them, because it's it really it's not fair to people who want a real change. The fake change and the fake promises and the fake outrage and the fake bandwagon 
shit is not fair to the people that want a real change. And the real change falls outside of those, those two parties. But we deserve to have the ability to supply for ourselves basic human needs. You know, we go to Africa and, and, and third world nations to help with so many things and we're taking food. Very few times has a thought ever arose to help them build infrastructure, to help them build gardens, to help them build ways to continually produce food, to produce for themselves. See, that's that's the most common sense approach to anything is to produce as much as you can for yourself so that you can become abundant and produce for others. That's what we need to do as a country. One of the biggest attributes we have, one of the greatest things we have going for us is we have really good people. And those people are stepping up right now. You know, there there's a lot of people donating a lot of money and, and, and help, trying to help a lot of people out from, from athletes to, to, to politicians. Um, and, and you have people, you know, you, you do have politicians who are, are taking this Seriously, and you know, I, I believe that Brashear, our governor here in, in Kentucky, is doing an excellent job. Um, I can't remember if it's governor of Indiana or Ohio. I think it was Ohio. Uh, it took some really good steps. It, it, it's it's across party lines. You see, you see, really good things being done, and and that's how we survive at a country is at at the state level. It it's it's very important. The second thing that this has really showed me is maybe I shouldn't have stopped prepping. And I'm not, I'm, I'm going to start back. When this blows over and this is over and done, I'm going to start back prepping. And that is to say I'm going to put back food with really high shelf lives, medications, things like that. No large bulks, small stashes of stuff that can help through a month, two months stretch, things of that nature. The thing is, I'm just going to do it for a different reason with a different method. Before, I was always prepping because I was worried about the end of of civilization as we knew it. You know, scare tactics, things that they'd scared me about. And then when I took a lot of the things like reality TV and the news and things like that out of my daily routine, those fears went away. I still don't have those fears. They're irrational fears uh, for many reasons. I mean, um, a lot of what things we would consider to be the end of the world, literally, there's very little that prepping could do for it. Nuclear fallout, things of that nature. Those are things I can't affect and things that I honestly don't look as long as we keep certain countries from, from gaining access to those types of uh, munitions. I, I don't. I don't worry too much about about that. Um, I worry now about people, not the majority of people, because I still believe the majority of people are good. But it only takes at one bad kernel of food that one disgusting particulate of food to destroy the whole bite and kill it all the good flavor that comes from everything else I fear those those people I've always been a second amendment advocate and I still am um I, I'll but I don't hoard up weapons and guns um I, I do keep a gun for protection in, in the most severe circumstances of which I've never been placed in, thankfully, and hopefully never will. More than likely never will. Um, I don't open carry a gun or uh, own any arsenal. Um, but to have some extra food put back, some extra medication, to have had the food stash now that I had five, six years ago, eight years ago, could be very helpful to some of my neighbors and things. I want to be able to help people in situations like this when they when they get to this. And I would have been able to if I'd have kept on that path. It, it's just a matter of keeping on that path for the right reason. 
because this illness is not going to take us all out. It's it's not. I mean, even the bad people in this are not going to take us all out. But it can be a lot more comfortable, and, and some people will pay a penalty. Some people will be a victim of this situation. Could be myself, could be anyone. But at the end of the day, if if we take the time to not do it in panic and not do it in fear, but to sensibly, sensibly stockpile and keep enough things to keep us from being dependent upon a system that is flawed in a lot of ways, then that, that can be a great benefit for ourselves and for our neighbors in situations like this. I will probably do a, a prepping podcast. because I mean, I was really big into prepping at one point in time. Uh, really big. And and continually was thinking about contingency plans. And, and you know, I mean, I really allowed myself to fall victim to uh, a lot of misinformation and a lot of fear-mongering. But everything doesn't have to be all negative. There are positives to prepping and and I, I look at this situation now and I feel like the positives far outweigh the negatives far outweigh the negatives so if if we could become more self-reliant um, on an individual basis with things like stockpiling and preparing and, and there's not a lot of expense in that and, and like I said I really think I'm going to do a, a podcast just over the prepping uh, but if we could do that then our our personal independence and, and self-reliance helps our collective. If we as a country found a manufacturing self-reliance and independence, then we as a country can stand a lot stronger on our own two feet, which allows us to help others around us stand. Mexico, Canada, you know, if, if they were to have an outbreak or an issue at the same time as us, you don't really realize until you look at our physical budget or you look at just um, programs that are disclosed to the public that we're actually allowed to know about, how many, hand, how many hands we have reached out across the, the world. The world and situations like this really depend on us, and we're really not ready for it. And, you know... Water, bottled water is becoming a shortage. And, and I know that's such a first world problem. I mean, there's still water accessible to, to almost all of us. But now if you take and take well water out of that equation, where a lot of people are on city water now and things of that nature, you know, then if you take out city water, then water does become an issue. But bottled water is really only an issue because of panic buying, you know, um, if you already had 18 cases set back and you rotate in and out, that's one thing. I don't do that now. That's one thing I've never really done. I'm not, you know, I've always lived in an area where water is accessible to me. We can, we can get spring water, mountain water, you know, creek water, you can boil water at any time. Um, but, you know, to have two or three cases of water set back right now is great. People going in and buying six and seven cases of water at a time is ridiculous. It's ridiculous and would have never been needed. But now it's causing people to need to go buy extra water because you're going to have people with 100 cases of water because they're not going to quit panic buying. They're just going to keep... It's it's a habitual thing. These people that started doing it continually. But if we can become more self-reliant, but if we can learn to research and understand things. So many people say... Well, you know what? Um, I, I, I'm not falling for this because I'm not going to believe what Fox News told me. I, this, 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 and this is, is, is the truth, and, and Fox doesn't know. Okay, where'd you hear that from? Well, I heard it from CNN. Okay, well, you know, it's the, it, it's the same. It's, it's two different sides of the same coin because I hear it in the opposite one. <laughs> CNN's not going to get me going. They're, you know, they're not going to get me turned uh, in this and this because I heard it from Fox. It's different. Or, you know, I heard from um, my doctor that this is nothing to worry about. 
did your doctor study infectious disease control? No, no. Uh, he's actually not even a doctor. He's a... Uh, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't even want to get started on that one. But if, if you'll just be more informed. Um, CIDREP, Center for uh, Infectious Disease, ha ha has a website. It, it's very informative. That's what these people do. The gentleman that's running that right now is... Uh, out of the University of uh, Washington, I can't remember, but but Sid Rep is is a great place to go. The CDC is is an excellent place to go. Um, I seen some stuff from a place called Kevin MD. It, it's a group of doctors. Uh, the Atlantic, maybe it was there. Somebody sat down, sat down a bunch of experts the other day because even the experts, even the people that really are on way opposite ends of this thing, but they just sat down and addressed the things they all agreed on. The things that were irrefutable and, and that that had really good information. Pick and choose where you get your information. Double, triple check it. If something seems like there is a a uh, an issue with its validity, then then kind of. But but don't don't just turn on CNN. This chicken little is always going to be say, is always going to be saying the sky's falling. That's just the way it works. But you know you know what happens when you cry wolf. We, we keep crying wolf, and people keep coming and buying things out and freaking out. And then when we're really in trouble and the shelves are depleted and everyone's sick because they they were scared enough to buy out everything, but they weren't scared enough to quarantine themselves. They weren't scared enough to follow the rules. When it's too late because you panicked, there's nothing anybody can do. You can make any situation bad enough to be a disaster. But you can make any bad situation good enough that it's manageable. Don't be the monster at the end of the book. Don't be the thing scaring yourself that ends up ruining everything for everyone else. Act sensibly, calmly, be informed. I, if, if you don't know to not trust the... The, the major media outlets. I don't know what to tell you. And if you don't understand that they're each owned by a political party and then those are each owned by various entities that, that shove money into those parties that, that it, to them it's a game. To them it's all political. If you don't understand that there's nothing I can do to help you. I mean I, I don't I don't know. If fear is your only God, then heaven help us all.